grateful to be here this morning. We are really so grateful. Your plan and your purpose. It's part of this place of overwhelming in you. And I want to say thank you this morning, Father, for, for everyone that's here in our audience that's watching this morning. I want to invite everyone, everyone that's here, everyone that's so all over the nation, all over the world that's watching, just to open up their spirits this morning, to open themselves up to a place so that the understanding of this message will come. We need to understand this world. We need to understand that what you are saying, that what you are bringing to the, to the body of Christ in this, these days. Because this is what will help us so powerfully in the days to come. Because your word says that we are living in perilous times. And we are not going to start looking like the world. The church is not going to go there. The believers is not going to look like the world. And because of that, we need to change. We need the transition. We need a place to step over the line. And this is why we are here this morning. So that we can step over the line. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I've been, uh, I've been speaking for the past few Sundays. I've been ministering on the spirit man and I've been ministering on the carnal man and I really thought to myself maybe I must just bring it all together into a place of just understanding because this is really a concern this is my concern this is a concern when I look at the body of Christ it's a concern when I look at churches it's a concern when I look at pastors it's a concern when I look at people that's ministering the Word of God in this season and is still, still struggling to move forward. People that's caught up in, in a, a place of the carnality. And unfortunately, majority of churches is established in this realm of carnality. They know how to bring people out of a place of being a natural man, a man that's not born again into a place of becoming a Christian, but they do not have the physical understanding and the experience to take them further into a spiritual life. So to me this is really a concern and uh, uh, because it's, it's, it's visible in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, it's visible in the body of Christ. And this morning I just want to bring the three what I, what I called uh, um, these three spiritual people, these three people together, or can I call it characteristics uh, or natures that the Bible speaks of. And we know what it is. We know uh, when we speak about the natural man, we speak about the carnal man, and when we speak about the spirit man. But I really want to uh, not, just in short, because it's going to take ages to explain everything in detail. But I, I just want to bring it to us in this format. So when we look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 from the NIV, it says, the person without the spirit. I believe that we all know people like that. I remember many years ago, before even I was saved, 
Do you believe that if I tell you that I was not saved, I was not born again, but I went to church? Yes. Will you believe me when I say that? Yes. I did. It felt like a responsibility to go. Or maybe I was pushed to go. But um, well, maybe my, you know what, the day that, uh, those days when I was sitting in church, and I kind of grew up in church, that's the sad part, grew up in church, a person without the Spirit. Just imagine a person without the Spirit. The scripture says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. But consider their foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. I will never forget how I used to say to a friend of mine that got born again. I used to say to him, don't walk with the Bible under your arm. Do you know that saying? Yes. Huh? That's a religious saying. That's a saying from people that's not born again. That's people, people say that. That's not. They don't have the Spirit of God. If you have the Spirit of God, how can you keep quiet? How can you not speak? How is it possible not to speak when you've got the Spirit of God? And this scripture speaks of the natural man. The natural man. And when it comes to the natural man, the natural man is, is living his life. But he's living a life that is self-directed. Meaning, he is the one that sits on the throne of his own life. He sits on the throne of his own life. The natural man's interests are directed by self. And although they are born into the family of being human, they live their lives without being a child of God. We were all there. We were born into this family of of flesh, in this fa into the family of being human. But without the Spirit of God. And if I can bring a few character traits of a natural man, I don't want to spend much time on a natural man because we know what's a natural man. It's a man without the Holy Spirit. They have no appreciation for the spiritual things of God. They are or can be morally good. Good people. Really good people. You get people that's so awesome, so good. They are morally good people. But they have no spiritual life. The natural man is uncomfortable about spiritual things. The moment you start speaking spiritual things, you can see the, 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 the discomfort that it brings to their lives. They want to change the conversation to something that suits their nature. It's very interesting how we act uh, friends visiting us this week and we haven't seen them for years and it's so interesting that when we come together do we share a history yes we do but every every conversation went out about speaking about God in everything that we spoke about God was the topic that, that's so awesome. That says something of your life. The natural man 
is uncomfortable when it comes to that, to the spiritual things. He allows himself to live in the flesh, but is dead unto God. In a church environment, when a, when a natural man comes into the church environment, they will treat it also like nothing special. They will come in and not stay. They move out. Or they will just drop out. They will come once to blue moons and that's that. It's enough. It's enough. I've done my duty. They are physically alive but spiritually dead. Because they are not born again. The natural man is not born again. He's not safe. He can sit in the church for years. He can be part of the church for years. Like me. In those days. I was part of a church for years. But I was not born again. I had not the living God inside of me. I knew him. But I had not his presence. And this is a difficult thing to say because we all know people like that. Maybe family members of us is like that. Anybody for an amen there? Maybe we've got family members that's there. And that's what I want to say to you now. It's very difficult to say when you listen to it. It depends on with what ear you listen. The further you get away from that natural man, the better off you are. You cannot buddy buddy with this natural man and expect God's plan to work for your life or in your life. It will never work. It's important to understand this. It's so important to understand this. I want to move into the, the place of the carnal man. And, I, and with the scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. Also from the NRV. Paul wrote and he says, brothers and sisters. He's speaking to a church. Paul is addressing the church at Colossae. He's not speaking to, not, to, to natural people, to unbelievers. People that's not born again. He speaks to a church. He says, brothers and sisters. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is Jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And he also says in Romans 8 verse 7. He says the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to the God's law, nor can it do so. So now what happens with this is, once a transition has been made and a person is saved, he's coming out of the world and he's coming into the kingdom, he's saved, he's redeemed by the blood of Jesus, he, he, he's accepting the cross, he's accepting the work that Jesus did on the cross and he comes into the body of Christ. He basically, when he comes into the body of Christ, he comes in as a carnal person. We have to understand that. Yes. Nobody comes into the body of Christ mature. Yes. Nobody. You come in as an infant. Paul calls an infant a child, a baby. That Greek word for carnal means, the Greek word is the Greek word sarkikos. And that means carnal. It means fleshly. It means sensual. This is what it means, three words, what that word carnal means in a Greek. 
And Paul comes and he describes the carnal man, he describes that man as a baby, as an infant in Christ. Is he in Christ? Yes. Is he born again? Yes. Is he saved by the cross? Does he accept the blood of Jesus on his life? Yes. But Paul calls him a baby. And they need to grow up. Because as a baby, they're going to have difficulties. The babies in Christ, or the carnal man, has difficulties trusting God. They struggle to trust God. And it's difficult for them to exercise faith. They just kind of do it. The carnal man is one who has received Christ as Savior. They are born again. They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They are speaking in tongues. But they live their lives in the feet because they are trying to live the Christian life in their own strength. If you could do a survey in our day within Christianity that you will find that the smallest part of Christians are spiritual people. The majority of Christians in, in such a survey in the body of Christ, you will most probably find that the majority of them are carnal Christians. Babies. Do you hear what I'm saying? Just look around you and you'll see and you'll hear, listen when people speak. Carnal people struggle to rightly divide the Word of God. And because they don't know how to apply the Word of God into their lives, they stay carnal. They can't grow. They cannot expand. And they're not trusting God. Here's what happens to a person who's carnal. The natural man is ruled by his physical senses, isn't it? Everything he knows comes through his knowledge. It comes through his physical senses. And here's a person who gets redeemed, who is getting saved. Guess what happens? At the time of their salvation, they just have the ability to grow. They've got the ability to grow. They're just not growing. The Lord gives them the ability to grow, but they're just not growing. Why? Guess who's governing them? The same senses are governing them that are governing the natural man. In fact, they are so close to be still natural. The only difference between a carnal person and a natural person is this. A natural person is still in bondage to spiritual death. And a carnal person not. Easier said, let me say it easier. Last week I said, I want to deliver you from the thought of once saved, always saved. The carnal man is most probably going to heaven and the natural man not. That's it. We cannot, it's not a discussion. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. That's it. Doesn't matter if it's your, your, your grandfather, your grandmother, your dad, your umma, or whoever, your child. 
not going to heaven. That's it. But because of the carnal man's condition, hear what I'm saying? They're useless to God's plan. Because they limit God's plan to the knowledge that they have. Revelation knowledge is available to them, but they don't receive it because they are still governed by their physical senses. In the body of Christ, you have to give up your physical senses as your guide to life. And you have to take on the spiritual revelation of God's word as a guide for life. This is just something for in a, in a place of faith that I want to share your faith. I said this, an intellectual led person or an intellectual led believer is a carnal Christian. The Bible says it is faith that pleases God. So faith is not something that comes from the mind. Faith comes from the heart, from the spirit, the born again spirit. Because the Bible says, with the heart, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. The Lord is enabling us to decide which kind, what kind of world you want to live in. Which is, what kind, which side of the world. We are in the world, we are in the cosmos. We are in this, in this place of senses, in this place of reality. And God says, choose where you want to live. Do you want to live in the sensual or do you want to live in the spiritual? Choose. So the mind of man is to be shaped by the spirit. That's where the growing comes in. Our understanding is shaped by the Spirit. It is the encounters that you have with the Lord that changes you how you think, how you speak, and how you act. It's the encounters that you have with Him that changes that. With a renewed mind, faith doesn't come from the mind. But what the renewed mind does, it enhances faith. A renewed mind helps to create that atmosphere for faith to thrive. I thought about this so long. This is what, what happens when it comes to, for instance, healing. People come for healing, but they hold on to their physical senses as a God. Won't work. I've watched them die because of that. You cannot marry it. You cannot mix it. It's not a mix and a match. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I'll be living this life in this earth. You have to give up your physical senses as a guide of life. For instance, let me give an identification of this. A person says, I'm catching the flu because I have got all the symptoms. I don't feel well. I'm running a temperature. It's there. The temperature is there. I'm running it. My joints, my muscles hurt. 
Now this is what they're doing. By physical senses, they identify what the problem is. And not only that, but by the words that they speak, they lay claim to it. They are saying, that's how I am. Physical sense wise, they are saying, that's how I am. I'm laying claim to what's wrong. But that's not what God has said. You have to step over the line. You have to enter into the way that God is thinking, into God's way of thinking. You see, the moment you lay claim of these things unto you, they are still thinking like a natural man thinks. They shoot and could grow out of it. Do I feel it? Yes, I do. I'm not stupid. I do feel it. But what I say, what I speak and what I claim, different. Different. That's why Paul said, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as mature people. I have to speak to you as infants in Christ. What is he doing? He's actually, he's identifying the carnality in their lives by the way that they are conducting themselves. And he uses words like, they're jealous, they're arguing, they cannot determine who's who, who's a Paul and who's a Paulus and all those things. I want to say this to you. Just hold it for me there for a second, Janine. The carnal man is a spiritual man, but he is primarily entangled, focused to the, his external circumstances. In a traditional church, we lock carnal Christians in a box of what we call sin. I want you to hear what I'm saying in the traditional church. We lock carnal Christians in a box of what we call sin. So what happens now is, so if we do, if we don't do any obvious sin, we say, we are not carnal. Is it true? In religion, in traditional churches, in religious churches, traditional churches, what we do is we lock carnal Christians into a box. What we call sin. So now, if I am not in that place where I do any obvious sin, I'm saying I'm not carnal. Is that true? We do that. But I want to challenge that understanding this morning of being carnal because sin, sins, is just one fruit. That comes from carnality. Sin is just one fruit that comes from carnality. And it's not the only fruit. I call sin fruit. You know why? Because sin is attractive. Especially when it's white. Sin is attractive. Sin is something that attracts people that want to eat of it. Because sin in itself is to the carnal man, the natural man, something good. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge the understanding that if you are worried 
you are going ouch ouch I just lost a lot of spiritual people if you are unforgiving you're carnal if you live in offense you're carnal if you are angry you carnal if you allow yourself to be controlled by fear you carnal if you are controlled by jealousy you carnal that's what Romans 8 and 7 says says this because the carnal mind is enmity against God what does it mean? what does enmity mean against God? it means when you allow yourselves to react to the environment around you you come into a war inside of you if you allow yourself if we allow ourselves to react to the environment around us we become at war on the inside of us <coughs> Paul says I cannot even tell you some spiritual truths because you are still connected to your senses your commitment to your senses is what's driving your life. <coughs> and a person whose senses is driving their life cannot enter into faith. Because faith doesn't let you confess what you see. Faith demands that you confess what God's word says. Is that true? It's a different thing. In a midst, there's people who get into this difficulty. In the midst of everything. In the midst of a battle. In the heat of that battle. I used to be there, you know, like it. In the midst of the heat of the battle, where the turning point is, it's much difficult for a carnal person there to accept God's way versus sin's way. Because they need something to believe. They need evidence. They need, they need physical, physical proofs. And their physical senses provides evidence. They look. They look and it looks like they've got flu. And they feel and it feels like they've got flu. And they confess they have the flu. But they want to get rid of the flu. They don't really want the flu. But by the time that they make the transition, they so deep into what they believe and they cannot get out of out of it you know, you know what I'm saying yeah. this is where it makes a difference there are people that believe that God knows exactly what their problem is and it's God's responsibility to change it. Change me. I want you to change me. At one clip on Facebook, the two rows, or the two, two kind of people, and the one guy said, who wants change? Everybody, we want change. Who wants to change? Nobody raised their hand. There are people that believe that God knows exactly what's going on in their lives. God knows their problems. God knows everything about them. And it's God's responsibility to change it. They believe that. 
They believe that their circumstances God knows and God's going to change that circumstance. But they will not take the responsibility for that condition. They will not take the responsibility because they've never trained and taught physically to take responsibility for their own actions. They grew up in a religious system that, system that says God will transform their lives and they will have no responsibility in this process of transformation. God's going to do it. The church is full of that people. 30, 40, 50 years in church. Not changed yet. Carnal man. Carnal man. You see, they don't understand when it's said that God has given us everything we need. But the requirement is, God gave us everything. Is that what we say the cross did? Is it that we, what we proclaim God did? Is it what we say God did? We start at finish. We don't start at the bottom. We start at finish. We start at the finished work of Christ. Isn't it what we said? Is it true? Yes, it's true. But the requirement for believing that is hmm. study study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed rightfully dividing the word of truth. You see, church, when it comes to these sermons, when it comes to, to speaking about carnality and what's the condition of the church, it's not a very exciting topic. You will have to fight the devil constantly in your mind so that you can listen what he said because he will keep you in that place of carnal so that you will forfeit the plans of God for your life. You have to understand that when we preach these things, that's why the church, when you preach these things, the church is empty. But when you speak about God's love, God loves you so much and the grace is just abundantly, the church is full of people. Because people don't want to change. They want the things of God, but they don't want to change. They don't want the transition. They don't want to hear that there's something wrong with me. They don't want to hear that my life has a condition. It's called carnality. The requirement is to the promises of God. Study to show yourself approved. How can you change the way you think about things if you're not in the Word of God? What measure is, are you going to use your knowledge? Then it's gone. Your opinion, it's gone. Our responsibility is to grow up spiritually, not maintain the same carnal attitude, but to grow up spiritually. This is the assignment of this house. This is the assignment that's resting upon cross-generation church ladies month. This color, dream, design, deliver. It's the responsibility to have. This is my vision. This is my mission. This is my assignment. And everyone that's standing in a place of leadership position in this house, that is what it is. Grow up. And this is the scripture that I use that God spoke to me about 
for this house. Colossians 1 verse 28. We, as leadership, we proclaim Him, warning and instructing everyone in all wisdom. That is, with comprehensive insight into the word and the purpose of God, so that we may present every person complete in Christ, mature, fully trained, and perfect in Him, the Anointed. If I can give you a few character traits of a carnal man. A carnal man is a man that's ignorant of his spiritual heritage. He doesn't have an idea what that is. It's governed by unbelief. Disobedient. Disobedience. Unloyal. Loss of the love of God. Loss of the love for God and others. A poor prayer life. No desire to study the Bible. Legalistic. Impure thoughts, jealousy, guilt, worry, discouragement, critical spirit, aimlessness. They don't know where they're going. They just go. They just live every day. I'm talking about people that born again. I'm talking about people that's born again. People that has got the Spirit of God in them. People that speaks in tongues. People that, that do crusades, ministers. I'm talking about pastors, ministers of churches. People that do crusades. People that pray for people in wheelchairs. And they walk out of that wheelchairs. And after they pray, they just go back to their own carnality. I'm talking about people, pastors, preachers that sit in mega churches for years and years and years in mega churches, 10, 20 years, and later on they just walk behind the pulpit and they're bringing the most stupid confession they can ever bring. And they will say, I'm sorry to say this to you, and they sit the audience of two, three, four, five thousand people in front of them, and they will say, I've been gay for the past 20 years. We've done crusades. We've done spiritual meetings. We've made new believers. We've brought people from the street and bring them into a place of, of carnality, of receiving Jesus Christ. But I'm sorry to say this to you this morning, but I love man. I love men. What? went wrong. And they pulled churches on that. Filling their churches on that. What went wrong? When is the transition going to come from being a natural man to a, to a carnal man? Yes, we cannot escape the carnality. But how long will the body of Christ live in a place of being carnal? When is the body of Christ going to move into the place of Romans 8 verse 19? 
that the world is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. The spirit man, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 and 16. The person with the spirit makes judgment about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, the spiritual man, has crucified his flesh and is alive under God. His flesh is on the cross. It means he doesn't feel. That's a, that's a most dangerous thing in the body of Christ, feelings. Feelings. Emotions. Emotions is carnal. He doesn't feel jealous. He doesn't feel insecure. He doesn't feel doubtful, carnal, lustful, sinful, but he says, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to react to that which is dead in me. He says, I'm going to exhibit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit that you're going to eat from my life will not be classified as that that's boxed as sin. The fruit that you're going to eat of my life is going to be the fruit of the Spirit. Because I'm governed by the Spirit of God, not by my emotions, not by the carnality of my life. That's a spiritual man. He has put the flesh on the cross so that he can put his faith on the throne. The spiritual man believes the Word of God. The carnal man believes his senses. The spiritual man is one who has come under the authority of God's word. The spiritual man, your senses can no longer detect your life. The spiritual man is not led by, led by his senses. What you hear, what you see, what you feel, what you think. No more. The things, these things, has no hold on the authority of God's word that's in your life. This is what God said. The spiritual man's life is detected, or is directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Christ is on the throne. And the spirit man yields his life unto the Lordship of Christ. His interests are directed by Christ, resulting that his life is in harmony with God's plan. You understand what I'm saying, church? The spiritual man looks in these three directions, in these three directions continuously, constantly, upwards, upwards, worshipping and devoting his life unto God, inwards, acknowledging wrong, repenting of his unchristlikeness, outwardly, always seeking to help and bless other people. Have you seen there's something missing there? There's nothing of self there. 
There's no self there. Self is in a natural man. Self is in a carnal man. Because it's self. Last, last uh, two weeks ago, I said this is what the spiritual man does. He meditates on the Word of God. His life is a life of meditation. Meditating on the Word of God. Worshipping God in spirit and truth so that that leads him to the fellowship with God and others. The vertical fellowship and horizontal. I say it again, you cannot say that I'm worshipping vertical. And not this horizontal. You cannot worship horizontal and not worship vertical. You cannot worship vertical and not worship horizontal. And the spirit man prays in the spirit. If you would ask the body of Christ to win last did you pray in the spirit. You see, church, time will challenge the Word of God in you. And at that point, when the challenge comes, you will know if you're a spiritual man or a common man. Challenges are the true tests for you to see if you're a spirit man or not. I'm going to close. These are pointers that that what Shmini is giving on on, a, on spirit man. A spirit man is one who belongs to the spirit. He doesn't belong to anybody else. The whole man is governed by the inner man. All the organs of his being are subjected completely to the governing of the spirit. His spirit is what stamps his life as unique. Everything proceeds from his spirit, while he himself renders absolutely alliance to it. No word does he speak or act, does he perform according to himself. Rather, does he deny his natural power each time in order to draw power from the Spirit. In other words, or in a word, a spiritual man lives by the Spirit. When we look at our own lives, when we really, really look at our own lives and we have to place us in, in one of these categories, God will marry someone that's saved, loving Jesus. I love God so much. God is everything in your lives. My knowledge. Their lives are they love God. They speak in tongues, they are born again. They are governed by their senses. 
by their emotions, by their feelings, by what they see, by what they hear, by their fates. But all these things are governed by that opinions, lusts of the flesh, desires of the flesh, the appetites of the flesh. I say it again, I say it again, they love God, but they don't trust Him. They love God, but they've got no relationship with Him. They love God, but their lives are self-directed. They say, I'm giving my life over. But when the battle comes, when the turning point comes, their senses guides them and their natural life. Carnal people never fall into spiritual sights. They always fall back into the natural. Always go back to Egypt. Do you love the Lord? Yes, I do love the Lord. How much do you love the Lord with all my life? Why don't I see you anymore, church? You love the Lord so much. You will not believe me. Yeah, I do. You're right. I will not. But this is really, this is really a good, no, no, it's not. That's the church. That's the church we speak of. Our conversation in our house is God, always God. <coughs> not because I'm a, a minister of the word, no, it's not. It's been like that for the past 20 years. It never, it never changed. Never. There's nothing that Rana and myself get involved in that overwhelms our uh, desires and heart condition around God. Never. It always turns back to God. It's a condition, it's a serious issue of the church, carnality. It's a serious condition. Because from that condition, our lives spring forth. We carry the fruit of that condition. Everybody wants somebody that they can trust. Everybody wants somebody they can speak to. But the problem when you speak inside of the body of Christ, and that's many believers' issue, is I cannot speak to anybody because they, they why? Because they just look like you. No. No. That's why the body of Christ struggles to change the world. <laughs> Because they buddy buddied up with the natural man and their lives start looking like that. I'm telling you the truth. <coughs> Wednesday night evening with the leaders I said to them, this is my concern, it's a concern to me. 
these people has been called to full-time ministry. Only God knows how they're going to get there. Because they're governed by senses. I want you to think of what I'm saying, church. This is serious, serious things. And for many people, it's, it's okay. It's okay to be like that. I'm only human. Coddle statement, that, man. That is not even a coddle statement. That's a, a natural man statement. I'm only human. Because you are not human. You are not human. See, if you don't, if you, if you cannot get to that revelation of that, that you are not human, you're going to struggle. I'm not human, I'm a spirit. And God decided to put this spirit in this casing. And now this casing is walking around. I'm scared for the church in the end times. <clears throat> Really scared for the church in the end times. It's not hallelujah, Jesus is good, gonna get you in heaven. If that was true, then why bother? Why bother studying the word? Why bother praying? Why bother church? Why bother home groups? Why bother coming together just to receive Jesus as Savior, stay home, be the punch back, go to heaven. Wow, if that was that easy. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Unfortunately, it's not going to be like that. And the problem is because we, we do not see what's going to happen in that day. We live our lives loose. But in that day, the other day I said to Rama, in the churches, in the smaller communities, in the smaller towns, we're going to see more funerals than we're going to see marriages. And that's the reality that we are in. And for me, it is just, if I have to go now, praise God. But my desire is, just, no, not, not yet, Lord. I've got too much to give, too much to do, too much to impart. Not now. And I know His grace is on that. Overthink what I'm saying to you. I've prayed, I started by praying and saying, Holy oh, Spirit, let the word be receptive. Let us receive the word. Because it challenges us to change. It challenges us to, to move towards God's plan. There's young people, there's young people that received word from God many years ago. And now they are not so young anymore. And it 
nothing happened to the man. Because they believe God's going to do it for them. No, it's not. It's just not going to do it for you. It's just not going to do it for you. Let us grow this house into a place of joy. Let us, let us as leaders have just one mindset to present everyone mature in Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you. I think when we when we stand here this morning and we just overthink the message, we come to this place where we can realize that that something is wrong. This life that I confess, although I am spiritual but I live this life in the flesh and I live this life in faith, it's not a true confession. Because much of my belief system is formed from without my senses. And this whole life, transition life, we don't want stuff, we don't want things to happen in our lives. But we don't want to grow out of those things so they don't happen anymore in our lives. In the body, loving God, loving you so much, still caught up, still caught up in the, in the natural ways of life. <clears throat> Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for the ignorance. Forgive us for not knowing the truth. Forgive us, Father, that, that we've come a long way and it's all beautiful. It's all so encouraging. And it only encourages just the carnal mind. And all the encouragements is just focused on no, you are beautiful, you are good, you are wonderful, God loves you. But there's no place where edification comes in and say, and truth coming in and say, we need to transform. We need to move out of this realm of this senseless sense place into the spirit realm where our spirit lies. And the word of your, the power of your word manifests in our hearts and we know exactly what to declare and to proclaim and see the changes and see the overcoming, see the victories. As we engage into this presence, into you, Lord, engage into that what you have for us, into your plan, into your purpose. Lay down, lay down this life that doesn't suit us anymore. <coughs> I pray for us house, for our house. I pray for our viewers, Father, that we will listen to this message. And if there's no conviction and no convincing through it, I pray, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. In their lives. 
every condition, every test, everything that we face, everything is to bring us to the place of realization that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. And this morning, Father, there is many people out there without the Spirit of God. They try and figure out how they're going to overcome circumstances, figure out how they're going to do things in their lives. And I pray, Father, that we will not go there because in Egypt there is no answers. But in the presence of our God, that's where the deliverance arrives. That's where the lies of the enemy is thrown out of the court. I thank you, Father, that you enable us to grow. Thank you that our growing, this growing process that it will lead us to a place of maturity. I praise you, Father, for our lives. This is the desire of my heart to see men and women rising up in this place of maturity. And I know it's going to happen. I know we're going to see the results of that. And I bless you for it, Father, in Jesus' name.